So again, my name is Valerie. I'm with Irish Hospice Foundation. I run Think Ahead, our advanced care planning program. We'll be talking a bit about that today and about some other uh, some other plans that the people that you are caring for or supporting might put in place. And that's how I'll be talking about this session today uh, for a family member, a friend, neighbor, perhaps. So anybody that you're caring for or supporting. But of course, you know, these are plans for all of us. This might, you might be here because you want to learn about it for yourself. You might be here because you're looking uh, to bring it into your workplace or understand things a bit more. But I'll be talking about it kind of in those terms, family, your family member, your loved one, your friend, the person you're caring for, and so on. But again, it's open to everybody. And let's see if we're going. Here we go. So just for today, you know, a few goals. I do want you feeling, you know, more comfortable discussing planning options with other people, or at least you kind of know a few ways you may want to get started with that, um, that you are able to kind of also support and encourage others to prepare for maybe the next or the future phase of life. Um, and that you are able to make your own decisions or support decisions of another person that upholds their own personal wishes, their values, their preferences, you know, of, of all. So this is about making and supporting uh, those decisions. Future care planning. A lot of times we call this advanced care planning. I think future care planning is just a little bit easier to understand. And while this does relate to documents and conversations, you know, it really is about these long term kind of sorry, documents and, and paperwork and things. It really is about these long term conversations that we can be having with people. We kind of call them a series of, you know, courageous conversations. They're not comfortable for most people. Uh, they require a bit of bravery sometimes, especially if we're maybe speaking with um, people who we care about and don't want to make them upset. Uh, it can, you know, take a lot of practice as well to kind of get to the point where we're, where we're comfortable with this. So, but the most important thing of, uh, of, of planning, of thinking to the future, thinking what might happen down the line as we age or as, as illness progresses, <clears throat> or just as we're trying to be practical and kind of put, uh, put our paperwork in order, is that these things take time. The conversations are the most important piece though. Uh, the more we are able to talk with the people close to us, caring for us, uh, or the more that we're able to talk with friends about what it is we want for ourselves, the more likely that we'll have, uh, you know, people around us who can advocate for us if that's needed, or who will know what our wishes are uh, when that time comes. These conversations are what's called person-centered, so really varies person to person on what's important to them based on their values, based on uh, the impacts of their own medical conditions, what those might be based on their preferences, just how they prefer to be cared for, based on their past decisions. And these are all um, what's called capacity-based. So again, if you're in here from a professional context, you might be really familiar with this. Um, if you're just kind of starting thinking about these things, you may have never heard of this phrase before. So I'll just review that a little bit. But but really, you know, this looks at again the whole person and what matters to them. They do require, you know, honesty. They require us sometimes to be a little bit uncomfortable, but to but to practice it anyway. Because when we're thinking, for example, of things like what the impacts of a medical condition might be. That does require honesty. It requires kindness, of course, with that. Um, but we need to be truthful about what might lie down the lines. It's an important, you know, sorry, uh, uh, death and dying and end of life. All of these things are are what we're looking at when we're talking about this, this phase of life. It isn't just death and dying, but the end of life. And it's an important time to be talking about this because there was some really great legislation that was finally introduced less than a year ago, last April, um, this is called the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act. There's no need to memorize that phrase, but just so that you're familiar with it if you hear it again. And what this did is it commenced a new service called the Decision Support Service, which I'm gonna go into. It fully kind of legalized advanced healthcare directives. I'm gonna go into that as well. And it updated enduring power of attorney. So it set up these kind of five different ways that we can make decisions uh, and 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 name people to help us um, 
uh, help us make decisions if needed in the future. So it's brand new, it's changing. It's still kind of working through some of, you know, the kinks of how it how it all plays out in real life. Um, but it's very clear in terms of, you know, keeping the person at the center of their decision making abilities for all stages and all phases of their life. And this is important because it's this big move from working in the best interest of somebody. What I think is best, you know, for you might not be what you want for yourself working toward each individual's known, what's called their known will and preference. So what is it that you want for yourself? How do you wanna be looked after? Um, how, what kind of treatments and decisions do you wanna make for yourself or can you make for yourself? And, and always working toward that. Now, with this said, as I'm working in the community, you know, working toward your known will and preference is great, but we have to know what everybody's known will and preference is. And so that's where some of this documentation that we'll get into comes into play. The conversations are important. Um, and then the documentation to back, back up those conversations is really, uh, really important for a lot of people. So we're moving from best interest toward this known will and preference. And we just need to know, you know, what is each individual's known will and preference so that we can provide the care that they want. This is that term capacity that I was referring to. And just generally kind of what this means is that a person is able to make a decision in the moment about the decision that's needed and that this might change throughout the day. We're always working toward when somebody has best capacity. So we're assuming that everybody has capacity unless there's evidence or something to support otherwise. And what we say basically is that um, if a decision is needed, can this person make that decision in the moment? So we're not saying a person never has capacity to do anything, always has capacity to do everything, but actually it's a lot more gray. Um, can this person decide, you know, from what to have for breakfast this morning to can this person decide, are, are they capable to, to pay their bills on time and this sort of thing. So capacity decisions can come into play kind of all the time. Um, or, or ability, you know, can, determining if somebody has capacity might come into play frequently. Um, and, and but capacity is needed, or even assisted capacity that I'll get into is needed to make a lot of these decisions. So can this person that I'm talking to understand what, for example, their breakfast choices are? Can they weigh out those choices? Can they choose one and can they explain that? So if a person can understand that they have the choice of porridge or they have the choice of eggs, they can weigh out what those different things are. They choose that they prefer porridge today and they can explain that to somebody or tell that to somebody. Then they have capacity to make the decision for breakfast. Um, for other issues, maybe they wouldn't have capacity. So do you understand that that capacity is really about what's needed in the moment and can they make that decision? Um, and if, say, somebody is able to make that decision, they always know what they want for breakfast right when they wake up, but an hour later, things are getting a little bit muddled, then we work toward um, helping them make that decision at the best time that works for them. So always working to find kind of those ways. How does this person make decisions best? And how do they explain to me what those decisions are? It's not always purple. So that's an overview of what this means by capacity. And... This matters because especially if we're working with our loved ones, um, we tend to want what we think is best for them. So we have an idea of, of the right, what's in their best interest, and, um, and we want them to kind of make that decision as well. And this leads to this thing called the capacity bias. Uh, um, and what that means is that if somebody agrees with us, agrees with what the best decision is, then we assume that they're able to make that decision. They're like, oh, they know what they're deciding. They're making, they've chosen porridge. I think porridge is the best thing for them. They must be able to make that decision. But if they don't agree with us, then we tend to assume that they don't have that ability to make that decision. So they've chosen eggs. We really think porridge is better for them for all the reasons the doctor said the other day, that's in their best interest. So uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and we assume that they don't have capacity. And obviously that's a small example of breakfast, but it can play out toward any number of decisions. And so we need to be careful in understanding these ideas um, when we're working with somebody really to help understand what their choices are in place, those preferences, those decisions right at the center, even if it's something that we might disagree with. So it's a bit of a harder one to kind of explain and to understand. So there will be time for questions and you can always type those into the chat if they're coming up as we go. 
but basically if a person has capacity, they're able to um, make decisions, they're understanding their choices, weighing them out, they can think through these things through. Um, even if they need a bit of assistance in doing those things, a person is allowed to make an enduring power of attorney that can cover their different aspects of their financial care, their personal care. They can make an advanced health care directive that covers their medical decisions, and they can make a, a will, um, and they can change all of these things as long as they have uh, capacity. I'm not going to go into wills today. Uh, we do have a program called Putting Your House in Order, where we invite a solicitor in to speak um, speak more to, to wills and other legal matters on that side of things. Um, but I will speak to Enduring Power of Attorney and Advanced Healthcare Directives. And I'd advise you, Sage Advocacy is also a great resource for a lot of legal matters. And there's people in there that are excellent with, um, with elder services, older people's services, uh, who I would recommend uh, uh, looking to for any questions that aren't answered today as well. If a person lacks capacity, and that's that's kind of how they're referred to it, they don't lose capacity, they just might not have capacity in the moment or have capacity to make these certain things, then we have the decision support service I referenced earlier. And the decision support service um, uh, allows for three different types of decision-making agreements to help somebody make legal decisions, financial decisions, really any type of decision that's decided there. So we'll go into all of these these different options today. And these ones tend to be the decision support service where people have a lot of questions. Enduring power of attorney has changed under this new new, new legislation. So there's a lot of questions there. Let's do my best to um, give you an introduction to all of these. And this is just to say that there is a lot of evidence why a bit of advance or future planning is supportive. It really helps people that have an improved quality of life through all phases of their life. Um, People maintain a sense of control over their life. There's shared understanding, shared decision-making, and that can be between professionals, the individual, the family members or the carers. And it gives people that voice. It helps people maintain their own voice through all phases of their life. All sorts of things that can be can be improved with, with just a bit of advanced care planning or future care planning. So like I said, you know, we think it's a positive action that helps people reduce stress, Fear and anxiety are also reduced as people do a bit of care planning. This is also true for carers, in particular carers and supporters um, have reduced stress, fear and anxiety as people, as their loved ones, you know, move into this phase of life where they might need additional supports um, or as they reach end of life because they've made very clear the type of care that they want and how they want to be looked after. Quality of life measures are improved. This last one um, isn't across the board, but uh, what we have seen where advanced healthcare directives in particular are in place for a bit longer than they have been here in Ireland, that there's a reduction really in those medical interventions at the very, very end of life. So for people who uh, it's important that maybe they're at home or um, where they don't want to um, be receiving treatments if if if, if their care, uh, their their quality of life is, is um, decreasing, then there's that ability for them to also make those um, preferences and decisions known as well. So it can really be a broad range of things, but it focuses back on the care that individuals want. I've used residents here, but it's patients, it's residents, it's family members, but the focus back on the care that each individual wants. And this would be, you know, we all know the golden rule, treat others the way we want to be treated, but this is the platinum rule, treating others the way they want to be treated. This is what all of this comes back to. So again, these are a series of courageous conversations. And look, there's a lot of words on this page. Don't worry so much about it. It's just a few little tips on when might be, you know, sometimes people are saying, you know, when am I supposed to start doing this sort of thing? Um, as early as possible is the best thing to do. So for yourselves who are here today, you know, start thinking about it for yourself. Uh, you know, think about which of these you might want to put in place, because it's much easier to think about these sorts of topics when they're far away, uh, when they're sort of theoretical, it's easier to put a will in place. It's easier to, to name, you know, somebody to make medical decisions for you if you don't really need those decisions made to you made soon, uh, as so far as you can know. Um, and but then there's all these other points where it might become more clear that some of these things are needed. Um, I'd actually add in here one that I haven't put in here yet, which is, you know, as a person's approaching retirement, you're at ret you've recently retired, you're in retirement, 
this is a great time. It's very practical steps that you can take to just make sure all your paperwork's kind of organized, done, and then you can tuck it away and you don't really have to think about it again unless you want to make a change to it uh, or if a major life event has changed. But otherwise, you can do this paperwork. You can kind of have these conversations early and then they're done. You don't have to look at them again. So retirement, I think, is a great time to start thinking about these things if you haven't already uh, put them into place. But if there is, you know, somebody, it, health is deteriorating, if it is getting worse, um, I think in the UK, they say if somebody's been admitted to hospital three times in a year, and they're over age 70, 75, then it's time to really start having these conversations if they haven't started already, because it might be a sign that the health isn't necessarily improving. Um, if there is a diagnosis of a life limiting illness, uh, whether or not a person might die from that illness, if there's a diagnosis of this, a great time to start planning as well. You know, treatment and planning, I think these things should go hand in hand as much as possible. Again, paperwork, you're done, you're dusted, you don't have to think about it again. If think people are, if a loved one's coming to you and saying, look, I, I'm thinking about planning, I'm thinking about my legacy, I'm thinking about what I want for the future. I think there's a tendency within families in particular. I know we're not all families here, but the a, a tendency within some family members to say, why are you worrying about that? You shouldn't even need to be thinking about that. Co you know, you're gonna live forever, <laughs> that sort of sense. Uh, I did it with my, I, I do this for a living and I kind of had that same reaction in my own family. So, you know, it's it's much, uh, can be much harder to have these conversations with loved ones and they're trying to have them with us. But these are all important thing, important points where they're opening a door um, and asking us to kind of walk through with them. They don't have to be doing this alone, nobody would. So, you know, what are the important, most important things you want us to know? That sort of conversation is really, uh, really an important question to start asking. And particularly if what a person wants, their own treatment or their own care might be different than what you expect, um, or even from what the consultant or the the, the staff are are suggesting. So if uh, you know I want something different than what my consultant might advise, I should really make it clear in my uh, paperwork. Um, and in my decisions ahead of time, what it is that I want for myself. Certainly there's all sorts of other reasons as well. It might be that there's um, adult children who need to be looked after and paperwork needs to be in place for them. Um, it could be uh, financial decisions that need to be, you know, aided. All sorts of things could be a reason, a reason to start having these conversations. And just a couple of tips, um, a couple of pieces that came in Last year that I loved media pieces that were really good for kind of starting to have these conversations. There was Baz and Nancy's Last Orders, which was a great show, um, kind of a, a fun, funny, but uh, but serious, um, you know, conversations about how to kind of think ahead, plan, plan for your future. It included kind of funeral planning in there. And I know some people, I've got family members of mine, and they've taught me uh, to, you know, have your funeral planned. So I've got my kind of playlist ready to go and I know where I want to be buried. And some people will absolutely know that sort of thing. They know what kind of casket they want or whatever it might be. So it can be that, you know, that can be kind of a fun conversation for people to, to start with, for people to start planning or thinking ahead. Uh, Mary Kennedy had a great one on there uh, uh, last year, Fod sale, I think. I've had people have told me many times how to say that and I... I think I got, I think I got it right. Anyway, um, you know, aging well. This is about women's aging well, but there's a great interview in there as well with a woman who um, doesn't have close family uh, living by her and wanted to have her paperwork in order and kind of why she used the Think Ahead to, to put her affairs in order as well. Um, and so just a couple different things that can spark some of those conversations. But as a reminder, you know, these things take time. It's all about planting the seeds and letting people kind of become comfortable over time talking about them. Starting with what people know they want, you know, if it's uh, what songs do you want played at the funeral? Or if it's, you know, are there are there financial decisions you need to make sure are, you know, are looked out for? Um, or is it, have you decided, you know, that what you want to include in the will, whatever it might be, all these sorts of things that somebody might have certainly decided, start there, start where it's easy, start where it's, uh, the conversation is flowing. And then, you know, take your time, come back to what was discussed before, before uh, helping anybody put anything into writing, just reviewing, updating, having more conversation. You know, so some people may approach this with different, uh, 
different draws. For some people, it's very, very practical. Doing the paperwork is a practical step that I can take, looking out for um, nobody has to worry about it. My One of my aunties is always, she has four children and she's like, well, I know which two I'm going to you know, designate responsibilities to and which two I'm not going to because they're never going to listen to what I want and these ones will. So it's very practical for her. You know, she's very much like, I need to make sure that what I want is done and these are the people who will get it done. So for some people, that's sort of the approach. For other people, it might be more emotional, um, including the conversations might be quite emotional, but there might be uh, things that somebody's thinking about. They want to make sure they have done uh, what, you know, while they have time to do everything, they want to make sure that that certain things are looked after as well. Physical needs being met is really important. Thinking ahead to, um, you know, where a person wants to be cared for. Can they physically be cared for in the home? Is there the support there? Is the are, is the setup correct so that the person is safe to be in the home? These sorts of things can be done with a bit of planning ahead. Existential spiritual questions people have as they're reaching, you know, thinking toward end of life and or thinking toward a phase of life uh, that might be frightening to them, uh, might be exciting to them, it might be all sorts of things, but uh, there'll be different kinds of questions that come up around that and kind of having the space to, to discuss those fears or anxieties or just to discuss those hopes to make amends all of this is included in care planning as well. Um, and then, of course, the social aspect of it. You know, um, a lot of people might think, oh, I want to be at home, but they might be quite isolated. And is that really what they want? You know, so it can be thinking about where you are, how you are um, interacting with people around you. All of these things um, can be looked at and discussed and perhaps written down or recorded in some type of care plan. And I can't emphasize this one enough, especially for family and friends. And actually for individuals, a, a big driver of um, putting the paperwork in place and having these discussions is so that there's less conflict in the family at end of life. There's more agreement as somebody is, as an illness progresses, as, as a person ages, um, wanting to make sure that they're the people around them won't be in conflict about how how they should be looked after and so on and so forth can be uh, a big driver for a lot of people and so using some of these tools or some of these conversations amongst yourselves to get yourselves on board can be uh, can be really beneficial for the people close to an individual or for yourself to make sure that uh, the family around you is looked after in that way as well. So with capacity, these are the types of decisions that we'll go over first and during power of attorney. It's often called an EPA. Um, it's sometimes called a living will. I find that phrase confusing, so I'm not gonna call it that here, but, but if that's a question that you have a living will, an EPA and enduring power of attorney, those are all the same thing. And then an advanced healthcare directive. So an enduring power of attorney is um, a legal document that you can write while you have capacity that says later down the line, if I don't have capacity, uh, these people are able to look after my financial and or personal decisions, personal care decisions. This doesn't cover medical decisions, but for financial and personal care decisions. Um, they can be very detailed down to exactly what decisions they can make or exactly how somebody wants to be looked after. They can be quite broad. Um, giving somebody or a few people all the powers once I, you know, once it's deemed that I don't, I'm not able to make those decisions. Um, I've actually, you can actually name one or two people, and then you can have a couple backups just in case something happens to those people or they're not able to fulfill the duties. And they can work, be required to work together, or they can work independently. What I, my only recommendation on this is that they be people who will get along <laughs> to to enact uh, your requests and your uh, your decisions there. Uh, again, coming back to that conflict and it'll make your care better if the people who you appoint in this role um, are able to work well together. Uh, so whether they are allowed to do things jointly or independently, that just varies person by person and the solicitor will be able to kind of guide you in questions on, on that sort of thing. My recommendation would be that people are able to work together well as much as possible. Um, statements of capacity are needed for this document. So a statement, you must receive a statement of capacity from a, a legal professional and from a medical professional. 
Um, and basically what this does, um, what the decision support service has allowed for now is that you can do this all through the decision support service um, website. I've included the link here. I'm going to include, uh, oops, I'm going to include it here as well. Just give me two seconds. It's here in the chat. This is the link to the decision support service. We'll have a lot more to cover about the decision support service. There is sort of um, an issue with the enduring power of attorney at the moment with the lawyers, unfortunately. I don't know if there's any lawyers in the room and, and you're, I would love to discuss this with you. What I'm hearing um, from many, but not all solicitors is that um, the paperwork, which is meant to make it easier for individuals to complete, to write their own enduring power of attorney through the decision support service has made it more difficult for solicitors uh, because the statement of capacity uh, it, it feels like a lot more work to them than the way that they would have done it before. And it may be the case. I think this is all sort of the thing that's figuring itself out at the moment. Um, and so going through a solicitor to make one of these documents, if you do choose to go through a solicitor, may cost more than it used to. That's not the purpose of the legislation. And I'm hopeful that within the next you know, bit of time as these things are all sorting themselves out that there'll be more guidance and more support for individuals to complete these. Um, the point of it going through the decision support service is that it's meant to be more accessible to people to be able to make them. We're not quite seeing that yet. Um, so, but in theory, a person can uh, create an account on the decision support service website you can also have documents mailed to you, but that process is longer and they're looking toward making this a um, more of an sort of online portal uh, into the future so that you can create um, an account on the decision support service, complete the relevant paperwork, mostly online, go out and receive those statements of capacity from a solicitor and from a, a medical professional who basically, what they say basically is that you understand what you're doing, um, you have the capacity to make these decisions, and then you can register uh, an enduring power of attorney document through the decision support service. It just sits there until it's needed. Um, and if the time comes that uh, an individual making these documents does need the support for, um, for their finances, does need the support for making decisions around their personal care. Then you receive, again, statements of capacity from, uh, I think this one's just from the medical professional who says, yep, they they do need this kind of assistance for making these decisions. And then you submit that and, and en enact the enduring power of attorney. So that takes a bit of time. They inform people that it's um, being made. They inform people that it's being enacted. And then from there, the, the people named in this document would have the capacity to work on their behalf for financial or personal care preferences. So that's a lot of information. Um, again, please use the chat if there's questions or unmute yourself if there's any questions there. Um, people can also complain through the decision support service. That's about any of the decision making agreements that'll come up through them. Um, but if somebody's named, as an attorney, uh, somebody's named as the, the decision maker on behalf of the, the individual making an enduring power of attorney, and somebody else feels like they're abusing their situation, they're coerc coercing uh, the individual, or there's any sort of issue, there is um, a clear complaints procedure. And they do, I work, I work closely with uh, some of the members of that team, and they review everything with a um, very closely. It isn't uh, simply um, kind of a, you know, an overview of the problem. They really get into them to try and, and make, um, make informed decisions and, and rulings as needed uh, for everybody involved in this. They're, they're very good. So enduring power of attorney, putting paperwork in place that um, is for a future date for when you might need assistance making financial or personal care decisions and you name the attorneys, the people who will act on your behalf for financial or personal care decisions. It goes through the decision support service to write it, to register it, and then later at a later date to enact it. And hopefully to never complain about it. But if you do, but if there is any concern um, and it's needed, then that service is there for you as well. 
I don't see any questions coming in, but feel free to unmute yourself or to type in a question for the chat. So, um, an enduring power of attorney can support a person in uh, their living arrangements, sorting out where, where they are living, uh, finances, uh, paying bills, uh, going through the fair deal scheme, anything along those lines, making sure that you know they don't remain isolated, that they're having the social visits, the personal hygiene, and that sort of care, taking, uh, looking after them as well, all sorts of things that might benefit an individual. And again, within these documents, you can be as specific or as broad as you want to make them. The next is an advanced healthcare directive. And within an advanced healthcare directive, an individual can do three things. They can refuse treatments in advance, they can consent to treatments in advance, and they can um, appoint or nominate a designated healthcare representative, somebody to make medical decisions on their behalf. Once it's witnessed and signed, then it's legally valid. It's one of the easiest um, and most accessible of these future planning documents to make. Uh, an advanced healthcare directive can be written, it can be voice recorded, it can be video recorded, and it can use transcription services as well to, to make a document. It does not have to be written in English, although it may need to uh, logistically be translated if it isn't written in English. Um, and, uh, but it's really looking, and they can come from other countries as well. So if you've written an advanced healthcare directive in another country um, and you bring it over to Ireland, it's still valid. And I have a question here about the enduring power of attorney going through the decision support service. What is the time range between registering and approval? I think it's meant to be about three months um, at the moment. And again, they were only the first ones um, by the end of last year, only the very first ones had received kind of approval because it I think it took time to get them sort of rolling. But again, that's just registering the document. Once it's registered, I think there's a three month window for its approval and then, but it's not enacted. Then you need to go through a process to enact it as well. Um, and I, a good question that's coming to my mind is, um, can you register and enact at the same time? And you can't because the person would need to have capacity to make the documents. And um, if it needs to be enacted immediately, then unlikely that they would have had capacity to make the documents in the first place. What I will say on that is um, that if a person had made an enduring power of attorney prior to 2023, then it falls under the, the rules and um, the 1996 enduring power of attorney rules, and it's a different process for enacting it. So they don't have to make a new one just because we're past 2023. That makes sense. And the same for an advanced healthcare directive. If somebody did make one of these prior to 2023, it's still valid um, and it doesn't need to be updated, but anything from here on would need to be updated or, or would need to meet the, the current standards. So um, I hope that's I hope that's a sufficient answer to get us started with that, but feel free to keep throwing them in there. Um I'm just aware of time, but we do have a few videos on our website, um, thinkahead.ie, I'll, I'll type that in here, uh, that have, that are um, a few nice videos for people to watch to help them understand what they are. If we have some time at the end, I'll share that out, but I'll put that into the email out to everybody as well. I keep, I've only, I've only just, we only finished these videos at the end of last year and I really wanna get them into a, a talk, but I just, I haven't been able to figure out how to get them in. Okay, so within an advanced healthcare directive, refuse treatments, consent to treatments, and appoint somebody. But there are about 10 pages of directions on how to complete this. This is a, the think ahead version of an advanced healthcare directive. Um, and I, I just don't recommend, you know, that people work on this alone. Um, it's, it's a big piece of, you know, it's a big piece of... I didn't mean to do that, but I don't know. Um, you know, it's a big document and it requires a lot of people's, you know, a lot of thought um, to kind of work through these different things. I'm trying to add the link in here so that you can see the documents yourself. Let's see if that'll work. Okay. So you should have the link to the complete planning pack, the Think Ahead planning pack that includes an advanced healthcare directive. So again, 
you know, I don't recommend that people work through this alone because it just is a lot of information to take in as readable as we've tried to make the documents. Um, but in terms of treatment, a person is allowed to refuse or consent to any type of treatment in advance. This can be diagnostic or emergency treatments. It can be, you know, therapeutic, any type of treatment for physical health, for mental health. Um, you can even have two different documents, one for physical and one for mental health, up to and including life-sustaining treatments. And, and what we've seen in some other countries where advanced healthcare directives are more common is that they tend to focus on this end of life kind of life sustaining treatments might be uh, a CPR, the um, feeding tubes, that sort of thing, ventilation. Um, but here it can be for anything. So it can include those things, of course. And that's maybe what some people will say that they, you know, would absolutely know that they would or wouldn't want some of those. And other people might be thinking about other sorts of things there as well. But this is what they're allowed to kind of consider in advance. Um, so chemotherapy is one that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on for people with um, different types of dementia, uh, but people can refuse surgeries or consent to surgeries in advance. Or I, I worked with a, a group um, from sort of a cancer support group, and there was somebody in there who said, you know, I, for example, there's a medication that, you know, I really don't like that has these side effects. So you know, I've refused, if I'm not able to, if I'm reaching end of life, I would, you know, ask that that medication be stopped. I would refuse that medication because it has these bad side effects. Um, so there's that somebody could, you know, consent to or refuse dialysis in advance, all sorts of things, all sorts of treatments that a person might, um, might consider. And, you know, depending this, this really depends on where a person is in their, with their age, with their, uh, illness that they might be working through, what sort of things they're thinking about. It isn't possible for all of us to think about everything, but given um, the diagnosis, given where you are in your life, um, what things would you absolutely know you would or wouldn't want and kind of starting there. What have you seen other people go through? Um, what are kind of common uh, treatments that you might be exposed to given your circumstances and starting with those kind of conversations? We're always, you know, always offering people the care of shelter and warmth and hygiene and food and water. You know, I think there is a fear of people are refusing treatments, that they are refusing all treatments, and that's by no means the case. But you may refuse any type of intervention, and then that's a legally binding decision that it wouldn't be given to you. So with refusals, any treatment that you refuse is legally binding and will not be given to you. It's as legally binding as saying, you know, I don't want this treatment now in my current state while I have capacity is a legally binding decision that I can make. And so it just extends, it extends that uh, that legality toward the point where you don't have capacity to make those decisions. So any refusal that you've made in this document is legally binding. And I should say that these documents only come into effect whether, whether asking for consent or refusing treatment if you're not able to make those decisions for yourself in the moment. So again, once you lack capacity, then these documents become enacted, they become, they come into effect. But for now, I can think about what kind of treatments I would refuse. I would write this into that document. What are the specific scenarios that that falls under? And, and do I refuse, you know, even if my life is at risk, yes or no. And then I've made my decisions in advance. Similarly, I can consent to treatments in advance. Um, however, the treatments that you consent to are not legally binding. Uh, for example, say I would consent to ventilation, but ventilation isn't actually what I need down the line, then I wouldn't be given a treatment that wasn't what I actually needed. So that's the only kind of caveat there. You're giving your consent, but it might not be the appropriate treatment um, and it might not be offered to you. But anything that you've refused is fully legally binding. Anything that I consent to, is taken sort of under consideration. So if it's, it's not appropriate, if it wouldn't work and so on, anything that I've consented to might not, be, I might not receive, but anything that I've refused, I would, um, I would refuse. And, and this is just to say, you know, you can always change these documents. And so encouraging somebody to work on these and then maybe they do need to be reviewed in five years and 10 years. Um, the, people's decisions and preferences can change over time. They're always allowed to change their mind, always allowed to make a new document, to revoke documents, as long as they have the capacity to do so. And then once these questions are needed, once a treatment decision is needed, and if a person is not able to make those decisions, then we look back 
to what they had previously written down as their refusal or their consent. The third thing that you can do in this document is appoint a designated healthcare representative. This is basically um, a healthcare advocate, the person that you name or the person that your loved one names, um, uh, who they want to make medical decisions on their behalf. It does not have to be a family member. It can be a family member, but it could be a friend, a neighbor, someone, ideally somebody that you trust to make, uh, to make these decisions if they're needed on your behalf for medical decisions. Um, for the most part, it can be anybody. It can't be somebody who's, say, working in the nursing home where your loved one lives. If they're not related to the, you know, if you're their child and you're working in the nursing home, that's one thing. But if it's an employee of the nursing home, they can't be uh, this, this healthcare representative. For the most part, it can be almost anybody that the person chooses to name and who agrees to work the work uh, in this role should the, should the question or should the time arise. You can name one and have a backup as well. So you can always have an alternate. At the bare minimum, what they're doing is ensuring compliance. So I've written down my refusals. I've written down what I consent to. And this person that I've named um, as my healthcare representative is just making sure that that, that document is followed, um, that the treatment is given to me as much as possible according to that directive. And they might advise if there is some, if something's unclear, if the situation's slightly different or so on, they might advise. But you can also just by ticking a box, this person can also have the ability um, and the responsibility to interpret on my wishes and to give consent and refusal where I haven't specifically named uh, that treatment in my document. And this, for a lot of people, this might be the most important piece. Um, I certainly think it's the, the piece that everybody should do, no matter sort of where you are um, in your own life. Um, the person that you trust to make medical decisions on your behalf, if you're not able to do so for yourself. So they can give consent and refusal on your behalf. And again, this is where my auntie comes in and she says, I know which two I could name here and which two kids I would not, you know, it is up to you to decide who um, you know? Who you would want to be these people for you, as long as they agree. It's up to your loved one to decide who they trust to make the medical decisions on their behalf, as long as those people agree. Um, and this is just to say, you know, this term is used a lot. Um, I look after my own mom. This term was used in our, you know, in the nursing home where she's living. Um, next of kin, it just doesn't have the legal standing that we think it does. It hasn't, this isn't new, it never has. It's just kind of a term that gets generally used because it works good enough a lot of the time. But say, for example, there are two or three people who disagree on how a person should be looked after, whether that's for medical decisions, financial decisions, it gives no, um, no hierarchy for who should be listened to really. I guess this is really referring to medical decisions. Um, so if there's people who disagree, there's no clear delineation of, of who has the right to make the decision. So for medical decisions, when you name or when your loved one names a healthcare representative, it just says, look, these are the people that I've authorized to make decisions on my behalf, either just a few of the decisions or all of the decisions. It's really up to you as you as it's written. So without naming these, you know, this person or without writing kind of the healthcare directive, the healthcare teams make the final decision on treatments, whether you want them or not, um, whether you don't want them and you receive them, whether you want them and you don't receive them, healthcare teams make the final call. Um, the less you've written in here, the more responsibility lies on the healthcare teams to make that call. Okay. So that's medical decisions. Also another great video that I'll invite you to watch on your own spare time. Um, just kind of explaining the difference between next of kin and the healthcare, healthcare representatives there. And so once a person has completed this, uh, they sign it, anybody that they've named in there as a healthcare directive sign it and two witnesses, all of that's described in the documents. Um, two witnesses sign it and then it's legally valid. It does have to be shared. There's no register for these. So Copies of it need to be shared with consultants, with the nursing home, uh, with the home care. Uh, copies might be left um, in the home as well so that they can be easily found if needed and so on and so forth. So we do think that there will be a register for these into the future, but we don't 
have a date or or anything like that kind of set up, but it seems like there will be one of these in the future. Um, and just to say on this as well, before I move on to the next, um, the next piece is that um, we have a version of this in Think Ahead, um, which I've put into the chat. The Decision Support Service also has, I think they only have um, a digital copy of this, digital paperwork, uh, but they have, they're nearly, identical in terms of content they just look slightly different but the decision support service has one as well so they're free on digital version from ourselves or from the decision support service and they're both going to be highly recognizable documents um so just as a reminder that people can always 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 change their mind with the capacity you can always change your mind you can revoke it you can um, act differently than you've written in your documents it's all fine you can you're not bound by these documents any of them until you lack capacity, and then um, then they come into effect. Uh, just a reminder to share out the documents there with everybody as well, because there's none. I'll come back to these, but this is just, we're gonna fly through for one second, which is that Think Ahead does involve other documents as well. There's a personal wishes and care plan, and this might be good enough for plenty of people. It kind of um, allows places for them to record uh, decisions or preferences. It's not legally binding. Nothing included in here is a legally binding document, but it helps to organize thoughts, helps people to think about things they might not have thought about before. You know, so, you know, where are, what's important about your finances that the family, that your family needs to know about. This is important for people. If you've ever uh, dealt with a, an estate after a person's death, you know that kind of tracking down all the accounts can be quite difficult. So practically for some people, having this clearly stated is really important. Um, you know, for other people, it might be because they know they might need an enduring power of attorney in the future for finances. Here it's all stored. Making a will, where is that stored? Place of care, really important conversation to be having before it's needed. Um, I don't think that it happens enough yet, um, but um, you know, what needs to be happen in the home to, to help people live there longer if they want to stay there. These kind of conversations need to be started early, you know, funeral arrangements as well. All sorts of things that a person might think about um, in terms of their care, including, you know, what's how do you like to be looked after? Do you run quite hot or cold? And uh, what kind of music do you like? And, and this sort of thing is just to let people know kind of who you are as well. So this and then a summary form, which just summarizes what, what's in those other documents. These are all included as part of Think Ahead as well. And that's linked there in the chat. But the last thing, I, and, and I apologize, there's just so much information to include here. So you, we might run a few minutes over. If you're not able to stay, this will be up on the website on thinkahead.ie and, um, and you can watch the last five minutes or so whenever. And um, I will record it all, but if you do have to jump off, completely understand. Um, but the last kind of couple of things there is if a person does not have capacity, there's still options. So if you're you're supporting your loved one right now and they don't have capacity to make decisions anymore, there are still ways that you can put some kind of more um, legal support in place for them to make the decisions that they can or to help them make decisions. These kind of go from the least invasive, this decision making assistant at the bottom, all the way up through it slightly more um, supportive, uh, slightly more uh, legal backing. I'll go over that in a second with a co-decision maker and then the court ordered decision making representative for somebody uh, who um, needs more support. And the documents, these are not the same documents used in the North of Ireland. These are all um, here in the Republic, but there is, um, I'll send out the um, links to um, the North as well in the follow-up email with the slides on there so that you have at least you know where to turn for, for similar documents there. Okay, so at the very bottom, um, the least invasive, I would say, uh, agreement that a person can make is called a decision-making assistance agreement. The individual making these documents. So I'm going to use, since we're talking about families and carers, the case of my own mom, for example. If my mom um, is either asked by medical professional or legal professionals to put some of these documents in place, um, she, that she needs a bit of help making assistance, or maybe she's seeing it and she's decided that she wants to make sure that the people that she wants helping her are the people who are helping her. 
So she says, um, I'd like a decision-making assistance agreement, but I still want to make my own decisions. This is the level that she goes in with. She could name me um, or her sister or another of my siblings to gather and explain the information for her to help her understand a way of her options and then to let people know what she decides. Um, really, this comes into effect because this says basically I can act on behalf of my mom to get information. So if there's information about her that I need, say, from uh, her bank or if there's information that uh, that we need, say, from the nursing home, I'd be able to act on her behalf to gather that information and to help her understand it. And um, this type of there is there are samples for all of these on the Decision Support Service website. And you sign this doc, you make that, you write up this document, you sign it, you kind of say, which are the decisions that you want help with? Which is anything excluded from that? People sign it and then you submit it um, to their register, but it doesn't have to go, nothing else really has to happen with this level. Nobody's allowed to be compensated financially at this level. Um, and nobody's really, there's much less sort of like legal intervention at this level as well. Complaints can always be made, um, but it's very kind of basic that you can act on their behalf to gather information for them. If a person needs more help making decisions, or for example, there might be the decisions that they would be making without fully understanding the consequences of, of those decisions. Again, that's kind of needed. That's one of those things that's needed for capacity. Then my mom, for example, could make um, a co-decision making agreement. Same as before, I'm allowed to gather and explain information to her um, and help her weigh those out, but we have to make the decision together. It always has to reflect her wishes, but we have to make the decision together, and then I can let people know. And this changes things slightly because there might be a decision, say a legal document that she needs to sign, and we both have to then sign that document. And I am not signing it as a saying that I'm legally bound by the by the agreement, but that I'm signing it as her co-decision maker to make, she has uh, my joint approval on this decision. This one, a person can be compensated um, slightly, I think for their, their, act, for their activities, they could be um, reimbursed for anything under here. They're also required to submit documentation on the types of decisions that they made they're subject to review, so there's a bit more weight here. But say, for example, if 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 a loved one is not um, able to make financial decisions, you wouldn't want them going and applying for a credit card. That credit card, uh, if they applied for it and received it without you, it wouldn't be valid. Um, uh, you would have to kind of jointly make that decision with them, sign for it together. So there's a bit more uh, oversight with the co-decision making agreement and helping somebody make their decision, there's also that review um, process as well. And the last is, and this is sort of the most, um, the most intensive form of agreement, it is a decision making representation agreement, decision making agreement. And this goes through the courts, the court, um, on um, recommendation by a professional body would appoint somebody to make certain decisions on a person's behalf. Um, so for example, if you have a loved one right now who um, has advanced Alzheimer's, for example, and does need somebody to make uh, decisions on their behalf, this is the process and the decision support service could offer support on this as well, how this goes about to name somebody to make those decisions for a person. They always try to uh, name somebody who's close to the individual. But for people who there wouldn't be an appropriate person who's close to them, there is also a panel available uh, uh, who wouldn't have carers or supporters or family members uh, to fill that role. So there's a panel of people to draw from, but they're always as much as possible trying to appoint somebody close to the individual, family member, close friend, and so on. So the decision support service, you know, this is something that I'm continually learning about as well. The decision support service has, which I've linked in the chat, has a lot of a lot more information, the codes of practice, what you're required to do, all sorts of sample forms, including for enduring power of attorney, any type of decision making agreement for an advanced healthcare directive, they have it all there. 
Um, they have a support line as well. So if there are questions that are really specific to your case, uh, to your scenario with, with a loved one, they'd be able to kind of answer and guide on those questions as well. There's guidance on helping to uh, weigh out capacity that tends to be more for professionals, but it can be um, supportive as well uh, for a person to, to just familiarize themselves with if you're looking, caring for somebody on, on how you support people to make decisions. Um, I'll just end with this quote from Catherine Mannix. She wrote a great book called With the End in Mind, How to Live and Die Well. And, you know, she says there are only two days with fewer than 24 hours in each lifetime, sitting like bookmarks astride our lives. One is celebrated every year, yet is the other that makes us see living as precious. These conversations are not easy, uh, but they can they can help to kind of shape the rest of an individual's life um, to be as as good as good as possible. Here's my contact information there. Um, again, my name is Valerie. That's our phone number. You can email me with questions, case scenarios. I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't have the answer, I'm always willing to kind of do the research and, and to try and find out.